So sleep and self-care is one of the most, um, I would say, neglected areas of college student experience and one that is very important. And with some minimal fixes can actually be really helpful to make some changes. So an overview of this presentation, we'll be talking about um, just basic understanding psychoeducation regarding sleep, why it's important. Um, next is we'll talk about um, typical sleep issues and problems um, for college age students, concerns and things that may happen, some specifics around sleep hygiene, and then lastly, what are some specific tips and or strategies to help with um, sleep concerns or issues. So first is there's a lot of myths around sleep um, or misconceptions about, you know, how sleep affects us, how it doesn't affect us. Some myths include beliefs people may feel that alcohol can help with sleep or falling asleep, when in fact, while alcohol may cause drowsiness and actually impacts restful sleep, it may leave you feeling more tired and hungover when awake. The second myth is common to college students, if I pull an all-nighter to catch up on schoolwork or other things, I can certainly, I can just catch up on my sleep during the weekend. Um, when in reality, the more we're not consistent falling asleep schedule is uh, it's not a deficit that can be made up and carried over the next week. And then lastly, if you're having trouble falling asleep, simply lie in bed and count sheep. Um, the reality is if after 15 or 20 minutes you haven't fallen asleep, you need to change up something in your routine in that moment and probably leave your bed and go do something else. That's going to be more effective than just lying there and continue to lie there or checking your phone. So how much sleep is needed? On average, for college students between the ages of 18, 22, 23, we're looking about eight and a half to nine and a half hours of sleep. Um, and that's playing out in the research and shows how much college age adults need to be productive or best function academically. So on average, it's about 70% of college students do not get sufficient sleep or inadequate sleep. And majority of college students report that sleep has significantly impacted their academic performance, and, and half of college students report daytime sleepiness, drowsiness, fatigue. So how does this affect you academically? There is a direct one-to-one -one correlation between sleep disorders and academic success. So if you look at our graph there, um, we know significant decreases in GPA with the presence of sleep disorders, um, insomnia, hypersomnia, oversleeping, those kind of things. And uh, the effects of sleep loss can be really negative across the board. Um, college age students are among those most affected by insomnia and other sleep disorders um, relative to, you know, other adults or people across the lifespan. So what is the impact of sleep deprivation? We can kind of categorize that in three areas. One is physical, then mental, and then social. Um, chronic sleep deprivation or loss of sleep can have the physical sense, a physical effect of lowering one's immune function and impacting the immune system. People may experience chronic health issues and continued sleep deprivation and fatigue can certainly impact your, um, you know, physical arousal, your ability to stay awake during the day or to attend to other needs. It can lead to like slowing um, higher rate of accidents and concerns. As far as mental impacts is um, sleep depri deprivation significantly impairs memory and learning. This is vital for college age students because it's through memory and learning that you are you know, preparing for exams, you're learning new material. So by staying up pulling all nighters, those kind of things, you're actually doing more harm than good to your academic learning. Um, you're better to sleep consistently regularly to um, better um, move memory from short-term to long-term, that is that processing necessary necessary for then learning or retaining information. Um, sleep deprivation can significantly impact your GPA. There's research to show that a deficit of two hours a night consistently um, has the effect of dropping a GPA by one letter grade. So if you're typically an A student, you're sleeping only six hours a night consistently, um, it's that much harder to be academically effective and can actually reduce your GPA overall. Impact of sleep loss can absolutely affect um, symptoms of depression and or anxiety. They can include increased cognitive emotional functioning. You know, they can really lower or your disinhibition or lower your 
your cognitive skills, emotional functioning, people feel more uh, irritable, on edge. And again, they can increase that level of stress. And social, socially overall, the impact of sleep deprivation can lead to more social withdrawal and then missing responsibilities such as work, school, or other social engagements. So what barriers exist for college students that impact sleep? Consider your sleep environment. You know, are you um, living with friends or peers in the dorm? Um, is it noisy, is it loud, are there a lot of distractions? Social barriers. A lot of times in the evening, that's when people tend to be most active or want to be active. You know, getting together with friends, gaming, those kind of things. Um, academics can certainly impact, you know, if you're one who's prone to procrastination and you avoid doing your schoolwork and suddenly it piles up and then the only solution is to stay up late to try and get it finished, that's certainly going to impact your sleep overall. So I really like this quote. I think it really talks about what we want to emphasize with this presentation. Um, states sleep is the golden chain that ties health and our bodies together. So it's this idea that if we are um, experiencing significant deficit in sleep, as we would with our diet or exercise or those kind of things, it's certainly going to start impacting our body, but then also our psychological and emotional health as well. So when we talk about sleep, we like to talk about sleep in terms of sleep cycles. So a typical eight-hour sleep cycle is meaning you're cycling through four to five different cycles of sleep. So there are four um, areas in sleep cycles, stages, stages one, two, three, and four. And we need to go through all those stages to experience what we call restorative sleep. That's where we feel rested, we feel um, rejuvenated and prepared for what we need to do the next day. If there are significant interruptions to this cycle, and then what we can really experience is a lack of both quality and quantity of sleep in which that is what can really impair our sleep and functioning overall. So, some things we can do for sleep hygiene strategies. Three things. We want to consider first your environment. That is the sleep environment where you sleep. Two is your routine. And very specific to your times on your routine. Is there, most people are familiar with a certain time they wake up every day, either to get to class or to work or other responsibilities. But do you have a sleep routine around when you go to bed regularly or when you wake up regularly? And then lastly, a sleep ritual. What do you do to prepare yourself for sleep? You know, are you up to the 11th hour, you know, gaming, looking on your phone, doing other things? Or are you taking time to build a ritual where you wind down, you prepare for sleep, you wash your face, you do all those kind of steps necessary to start that process? So what we'll talk about is how simple adjustments to sleep hygiene, that is those three factors, can significantly improve our sleep overall. First is we want to consider our sleep environment. So this is your room. This is where you're sleeping. Um, we want to consider um, sounds, light, and temperature, okay? So in a, a better sleep environment, you want to consider limiting noise. So we want to remove distractions from your room. So it could be, you know, music sound from outside of your room, um, television, computer, anything that would distract or disrupt sleep. Really important. If you find you're a really light sleeper, some people like to wear earplugs to sleep. You know, if you live near a busy street or throwaway. Um, next is limiting our light sources. So blue light, that, that is the light that is commonly found in our electronics, our phones, laptops, televisions. Um, it tends to inhibit our sleep. So in a sense, what that blue light does, it stimulates areas within our visual cortex and brain that uh, keep us alert and keep us awake and can actually inhibit sleep. So limiting light sources is a really vital and important thing to help us sleep. Please do not fall asleep with your phone in your hand or looking on your um, you know, Instagram or other things. So limiting that is a really effective way to help with that. And even beforehand, so not just up until, again, the 11th hour, but maybe considering taking a break from electronics an hour or even half an hour before bed. Next is consider temperature. Keeping your bedroom cool and dark is often the best ways to encourage sleep. So again, sleep environment. Our bedroom, we want to reduce noise pollution both inside and outside the room. Reduce light sources such as a television, laptop, or phones. Best if they're not there entirely. Cold is best for temperature. And 
oftentimes a clean and organized room makes for a very healthy sleep environment. So avoiding clutter, making your bed, um, your bed itself. Um, we really should only be using our bed for sleep or sex, nothing else. So our bedroom in our bed is, it's not a couch, it's not a table, it's not a place where we you know, are engaging in other activities. We want to use our bed only for sleep. The reason we do this is we want to train our brain to associate bed with sleep, okay? So, you know, if suddenly you're up at night and you're watching Netflix in bed, you're reading your phone in bed, you're studying, doing all these things, your bed is no longer a bed. Suddenly it's a couch or it's like a common room area. When we treat our bed like a bed, then our brain becomes to associate our bed with sleep. And that can facilitate us falling asleep much sooner rather than, you know, tossing and turning. Next is we want to consider a sleep routine. If you don't have a sleep routine, you should get one. Um, our bodies and minds, we need consistency and routine to, uh, to function optimally. Um, question I'm asked, also, do I really need a bedtime? Yes. Um, one of the best things you can do to get consistent and solid sleep is not only have a time when you wake up, but actually schedule a bedtime yourself, for yourself and do it so consistently. So we have natural rhythms within our body that is a circadian rhythm that um, prompts a sleep cycle or routine. By having a consistent bedtime, we're kind of tapping into that system and using that system to facilitate better sleep habits. So where circadian rhythm can really like get us into routine that maximizes sleep. People have probably heard of melatonin, right? So it's a over-the-counter um, like medication or something that you can purchase that is supposed to help facilitate that process of falling asleep. Melatonin is a naturally occurring um, substance within our brain and it works with that circadian rhythm. So if we fall into a routine, our brain releases melatonin naturally and prompts that cycle of sleep. So we don't always need the medication or to find that if we are living by our good routine and we can actually do that naturally. So again, the circadian rhythm I mentioned is kind of labeled here. Um, if you notice, there's a few little things in there, but what I want you to pay attention to is that consistency of routine. So the inner line shows uh, eight hours of sleep. So around 11 o'clock, the person is going to sleep, going all the way around, experience restorative sleep, deep sleep, REM sleep, until waking time when melatonin release stops. So it's the start and stop of that release what we're looking for by having routine. Um, it's a really good link here on this YouTube page. We'll see if we can go to. It talks about um, sleep schedule. So I'll give a second. If you want to write that down or note that, you can check it on your own. It's just a little graphic cartoon talking about the importance of sleep schedule. Next, these are things to avoid when we're talking about um, getting into a better sleep routine. First is electronics. Um, I recommended earlier, if you can, an hour to 30 minutes minimum before bedtime is consider eliminating use of electronics. Cell phone, TV, computer, and doing kind of a break from that to kind of get yourself into kind of slow down pattern to where you're prepping for bed. Similarly is stimulants, caffeine, nicotine, things like that. Even cannabis can be a stimulant of sorts. Um, avoiding stimulants before bedtime can actually help with sleep. Alcohol is also something that will impact sleep negatively over time. And even in the moment, um, people who drink alcohol, you typically don't have very restful sleep or get fully through all those four cycles. Um, clock watching. If you find yourself checking your phone regularly, watching the clock in bed, um, you know, something needs to change. Your bed is no longer working. You need to get up and go do something else. Clock watching is not effective or a way to kind of like help the sleep. It's actually kind of should be a cue for you that something's not working. Next is sleep medications. Um, sleep medication that's prescribed by a physician may be fine. Um, although I would urge people to consider some of these more natural methods um, that, are, that are proven methods to help with sleep that we'll talk about. Um, next, daytime napping. If you feel that you have a constant need to nap or sleep during the day because you're fatigued, something is wrong with your sleep hygiene and routine. Um, we shouldn't need to nap. Um, 
if you feel you need to, I suppose a 10 or 15 minute nap should be fine. But if you are napping regularly and consistently, something's off with your sleep routine so much that you feel that you need to nap or sleep during the day. Um, exercise is actually a really good thing for sleep, but after a certain time in the afternoon, so it's no longer as effective. So an example with this, of this would be if you have a, say a 10 p.m. Bed, bedtime, really intense physical exercise, cardiovascular exercise that gets you kind of like pumped up is really not the most effective into them falling asleep afterwards. And then we want to avoid oversleeping on weekends. So again, remember we said we can't make up a deficit for sleep. It doesn't quite work that way. If you find that you are, you know, fatigued or tired, still keep the routine during the weekends. We don't want to oversleep and throw things off the other direction where we're engaging in hypersomnia that is sleeping too much. So things we can do instead is we can try some relaxation techniques. Stretching, yoga, meditation can be really helpful and effective things to do prior to falling asleep to, again, reduce um, stimulus, lower that, and then prepare for bed. So stimulus control, we mentioned that earlier about um, reducing distractions and things in your environment. Constructive worrying. So a lot of times people will express concern about, I can't fall asleep because my brain's, you know, on my thoughts are racing, I have all these worries. Um, if you are worrying, we'll talk about a strategy you can use instead of worrying laying in bed, it's getting out of bed, writing those thoughts and worries down to deal with the next day. Some things to do is some physical activity um, earlier in the day, including exercise is actually really effective. So a lot of times um, as college students, a lot of our day-to-day -day activity is sedentary. So we're sitting in a classroom working on our computer or we're sitting at work, or we're studying in the library or at home. So a lot of sitting, a lot of sedentary activity can leave us emotionally and psychologically exhausted, like fatigued, but not physically fatigued. So while we feel exhausted and want to sleep, physically we're not there. So some daily physical exercise can be really helpful to do that. And then some daily exposure to sunlight. Um, regular sunlight, um, day to day, it helps boost our mood. It's great to be outside, to be active, to be involved in that way, but it also helps with our circadian rhythm. So when it does get darker later in the evening, it helps stimulate that melatonin use if we've had regular sunlight exposure and our daily vitamin D. So typical sleep concerns, there is first sleep latency, which is defined as a difficulty or inability to fall asleep in a reasonable amount of time. So on average, people should be taking 10 to 15 minutes to fall asleep from when their head hits the pillow. Now, if you're spending longer than that, it's half an hour, an hour or longer, you have an issue with sleep latency. Uh, next is sleep disturbance. That's frequent waking or inability to go back to sleep. Next is we have early morning awakening. So if you're waking before your alarm clock or your scheduled time or before you're anticipated, that's a sleep concern. And then of course, insomnia. So this is a sleep disorder characterized by difficulty falling and or staying asleep. And oftentimes a lot of these things will coincide with hypersomnia, that is oversleeping, right? So sleeping more than those eight or nine hours, sleeping 10, 12, 13 hours a day is indicative of some sleep issues. So how do you go about changing your sleep? First, you need to recognize there's a problem. Is your problem that you can't sleep or won't sleep? So a can't sleep problem is a physiological problem or concern which you might need to talk to a physician about or go find a sleep study to, to do a little further. Um, so you may need some medical intervention. Almost all the time though, when it's a problem, it's a won't sleep problem. That is sleep hygiene is off, there's no routine, there's no kind of ritual in which you actually engage in sleep um, positively. And that can, be, that can be unlearned. You can learn new techniques and strategies to help with that. Um, next step is we want to take it seriously. We want to stop. Um, we want to start prioritizing our sleep. Okay, so stop fighting our biology. If you are tired, you know, pushing through that or trying to do other things or make up for it, um, you're kind of running counter to what we want you to do. Next, invest in your health and well-being. Um, so other healthcare behaviors and routines, so nutrition, physical activity, is going to be also helpful in treating underlying sleep concerns. You know, taking care of ourselves, and then sticking with it. So it's probably taking you some time to get in a bad sleep routine. 
it's going to take you um, an, some additional time to break out of that cycle and actually build a positive sleep routine. But that can be done um, with some effort and continual like work with that stuff, with those in mind. So again, can't sleep was our issue with insomnia, right? So we prioritize sleep, but still have difficulty falling asleep. We have prolonged onset. Maybe there's nighttime waking, um, fatigued, but not necessarily sleepy. Whereas won't sleep is you can fall asleep easily, but sleep is not a priority. Um, and so oftentimes people use the weekend to catch up and there is a possibility of daytime sleepiness. So tips and strategies, preparing for sleep. One is to establish a sleep ritual and use the power of habituation or routine. Two is fatigue. Um, fatigue does promote nighttime sleep, but daytime fatigue can be problematic. So fatigue's not a bad thing. It's You wanna feel fatigued when it's time to go to bed, not during the day. And then sleep disturbance, some things we can do to treat that. So sleep ritual. Sleep ritual is establishing a routine or ritual in which you begin the process of releasing melatonin and then initiating that sleep cycle. So sleep promoting behaviors, those include non-stimulating activities, the behaviors that have a soothing or calming effect. So those could include reading, stretching, meditation. Some people may prefer taking a hot shower or bath to help initiate sleep. Next is fatigue. Nighttime fatigue is great. Physical activity, daily physical activity, exercise are excellent for inducing nighttime routine. Remember we talked about a lot of um, our experience right now is being sedentary, not being particularly physically active. Um, some daily physical activity or exercise will help get you to a point where you feel fatigue around the time you should feel fatigue at night. If you begin to feel fatigue, you're drowsy, you're starting to nod off. Do not fight the fatigue or what you're doing. Stop what you're doing and go prepare for bed. Day daytime fatigue, however, can be problematic. Um, you may feel tempted to nap. However, I would really discourage you from doing so as it may disrupt your sleep pattern. So if you're napping during the day to reduce fatigue, then guess what? All that fatigue you've built up during the day, it's no longer there at night when you want to fall asleep. And then you restart that cycle over again of insomnia, difficulty of falling asleep, all those issues. So what about sleep latency? What if my problem is I'm lying in bed, I'm trying to sleep, and I can't sleep? So I'm experiencing what we call ruminative thoughts. So thoughts that occur again and again, we can't seem to get them out of our head. Um, so primary causes for sleep latency, that is you're not falling asleep within 15 or 20 minutes of lying down. There's ruminative thinking, overstimulation, or overall neglected sleep hygiene. So what do you do? If you find it's been 15, 20 minutes, you haven't fallen asleep, first step is to get out of bed. Do not allow your body or brain to associate bed with anything other than sleep. If you're going to worry, worry somewhere else. Go sit on your couch. Go sit on the floor. Do anything else, but don't stay in your bed. So first step, get out of your bed. Go somewhere quiet, somewhere dark, somewhere non-stimulating. Avoid all electronics, phones included. One thing you can do is if you're having rude thoughts or worries, write them out. Place them on a piece of paper and put them aside to deal with in the morning and then go back to bed. Second thing you could try to do is after getting out of bed is doing some deep breathing, stretching or meditation. So something that's going to be calming, relaxing. And what I like about these activities, it really takes the focus away from maybe those ruminative thoughts into something very specific, which is reducing stress and anxiety through use of some effective strategies. Next is do something non-stimulating. Um, Crack open a really boring textbook, something that's going to be, again, non-stimulating, not very fun. You do this a couple times where you've got out of bed after 15, 20 minutes. You've done one of these three activities. You go back to bed. If your brain continues to ruminate or your body continues not to fall asleep, you need to repeat that pattern. Eventually, your brain will be tired of what you're trying to do, which is to stop it from worrying in bed. Okay. And this is a really wonderful quote to sleep being the best meditation. That's a meditation I can get behind. Okay, so in conclusion, it's up to you. Um, most sleep concerns related are related to issues of sleep hygiene and they can be managed with behavioral interventions. So please consider trying some of the things we talked about. Again, setting a routine, 
So that is your sleep going to sleep the same time every day and waking up at the same time every morning. Um, having a sleep ritual. So what do you do before you fall asleep? Are you cutting out electronics half an hour to an hour beforehand? Are you taking a shower, washing your face? Are you changing into your pajamas, doing something that's going to get you into a routine of falling asleep? And next, dealing with like sleep late 